don't have this problem. Thank <laughs> you. 
Kinsey's here. Michaela's here. Tudor is here in WBSU gear. For WBSU Wednesdays. Rice is here in WBSU gear. And so is Midkiff. We are recording, so if you guys have any questions, let me know. So, Hudson is here. Hodges is here. I was just telling them that we are recording, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Just is wearing WBSU gear. I mean, adjust your your grade a little bit. Extra bump in the grade. Well, for announcements, um, obviously next week is the last week of class, and the week after that is finals. Off the top of my head, I don't know when finals are. Unless they've changed it, then our finals should be Monday morning at 8. Um you guys can go find that online yourself, not just for my class, but for every class. But I will also share it with you when I when I remember to do so. But yeah, most likely it'll be Monday morning at 8. So not this Monday, but next Monday at 8 a.m. It will be online just as usual. And also because it's online, this is the one time, good morning, the one time I don't care when you take it, as long as you let me know beforehand. So yes, it's going to open at 8 a.m., and what I think we have an hour and a half to finish it, however long it is, you'll have that long and I'll let you know. But if you don't want to take it Monday because you have another final that's harder for you, you're like, let me just put this off until Friday. That's fine. As long as you let me know beforehand. You can't just not show up on Monday and not take the exam. And, you know, you'll get a zero if you do that. One of, one of you has gotten a zero four times for not taking an exam and not taking the retest. I don't know why. Anyway, so yes, for the final. If you want to take it on any other day other than a Monday, let me know beforehand, and I can let that I can make that happen. Also, just like any other time we've had an exam, if you want more time to take it, you can do that too. As long as you meet me, you have to let me know beforehand so we can find a time to meet online so I can make sure you're taking a closed book exam and all that good stuff. So that's it for the final. I'll give a lot of uh, reminders between now and then about the finals. That also means you only have a week left, a week left for independent work. So if I were you, I would really work on independent work, especially if you're failing. If you got a bad grade, like work on your independent work. It's a free 100 points. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how good you are at showing up on time. All you have to do is write. And also, you know, you could watch videos and do all that other stuff. But just answer, think of biology questions, look them up and write about it. It's that easy. If I were failing, I would have more than 100 points because like, I'm like, I can't take a test for to save my life. But at least I can just write. Yes, sir. Question. What? 
Um, I think there's still some out there I haven't graded yet. Yeah. Good question. So yeah, make sure we work on that. Um, as far as points are concerned, I would prioritize, again, this is mostly for the people who are failing. You, the, your biggest bang for your buck is going to be the final exam. That's worth 200 points, right? So that in itself is worth more than attendance total. That's worth more than independent work, independent work total. And it's almost worth as much as uh, the lab. So really focus on the final. Start studying for the final, but you should focus on that if you're failing, because again, that's where your biggest bang for your buck. Then beyond that, you should focus on independent work, because again, that's 100 points, that's a whole letter grade. It's free points in a sense, because you can just keep turning in uh, stuff until you hit 100. And then after that, I would focus on uh, fixing labs and fixing uh, missed attendance. But yeah, so again, final exam preparation and independent work is what I would focus on if your grade is not where you want it to be. What else? Lab. Okay, lab next week. You guys are going to like this. And this is going to, this is, I'm putting the ball in your court. So for next week's lab, all you have to do is email me and tell me, I want this grade. You know, pick a lab that you've already done and say, I want that to be my grade for this week. So if you have one that already has a 20, you can just say, all right, I want that one to be my grade. Or here's the catch. If you have one that you just did horribly on, like you got, maybe you didn't do it and you have a zero. And you can take that week to do that exam or do that lab and say, look, I want this to be my lab for the week. I'm going to redo it. And I want that to be the grade. So not only will you get the, the new grade for next week, but it'll fix it for the previous time, you the, the first time you took it. Does that make sense? So if you didn't do a lab and you choose to do that, one, that'll fix that week's grade. And also that'll be your new lab uh, grade for the, the next week. If that doesn't make sense, just meet me online and we'll talk about it. That'll be next week's lab. This week's lab, obviously, if you haven't done it yet, you should come in the come in the class. There is a lot of confusion. Hopefully, we'll clear that up in lab about the uh, pre-lab questions. Um, if you're online, obviously, it's only going to be three quarters credit. Um, well, yeah, let's say three quarters credit. But anyway, the first attendance word, if you're online, or I guess even if you're in person, is going to be pink, like the color pink. All right, let's do attendance really quick. If I say your name and you're here, just say here. If you're wearing WVSU gear, say WVSU, and I can look and confirm. So David, Eric, yep, gotcha, with your WVSU gear. Um, Cedric's online. Richardson, Massey, Newton, Burdett, Felder. Gotcha. WVSU gear, extra credit. Um, Asbury, Bowers is here. Hemmings, Reed. But that's it. Everybody accounted for? All right, let's jump back into chapter 20. Another thing I'm sure you've noticed by now, it's going to be odd, but we're doing, once we finish chapter 20, we're going to jump backwards and do chapter 19. It's just a little experiment that I'm doing. You guys don't need to worry about it. It should be fine. <clears throat> anyway, we are, again, on the third of the four of the main bullet points for Chapter 20. We're talking about ecosystem ecology. We already did the introduction. That's how we ended class on Friday, was talking about what an ecosystem is. So, again, a population would be like all the humans in this room, right? That's a population. A community would be all the living things in this room. So all the humans that you see and all the microbes floating around in the air that you can't see and all the bacteria inside of us that you can't see, right? That's a community. An ecosystem includes everything. So not just all the living things, but all the non-living things that affect it. So that includes things like climate, energy, uh, soil characteristics, and water, right? That's where we left off. So that's what an ecosystem is. Let's talk about ecosystems. Before we do, for some reason, your book put it forth like this. There's something called a terrarium. I'm not going to ask you what a terrarium terrarium is, but it is a it's a decent example um, because in a sense the Earth is like one gigantic terrarium. But a terrarium is a community that interacts with abiotic factors. At least that's the way your book describes it. There's other ways to describe it. Um, I think most people would describe a terrarium as like a, an aquarium, but instead of having aquatic things, it's land things that live on land. Anyway. Um, an aquarium is also a small scale ecosystem. So if you've got it just like an, an aquarium would be too, right? It's, it's its own contained little ecosystem, right? Uh, for the most part, there's not stuff coming in or going out, at least for the terrarium. Um, so for that reason, 
Here's what you need to know about all ecosystems, not just the terrarium. And this is where the information is important for, for the exam. Energy flow. We're talking about energy flow for an ecosystem. The passage of energy flows through the ecosystem, right? Unlike the chemical or matter, I'll even write matter here, or try to, it always comes out horribly. Chemicals or matter, however you want to say it in this, in this conversation, those are interchangeable. That gets recycled. So energy flows through matter or chemicals, however you want to say it, it gets recycled. That's an important concept. Make sure you understand that. Energy flows through an ecosystem. Matter is recycled. Now, of course, if we're talking about a specific, um, one specific ecosystem, a lot of times some of the matter does come and go, right? So if you talked about the ecosystem of the Canal River, obviously even matter is coming and going as the water flows. But if you want to think of the whole world as an ecosystem, because in a sense it is, right? So in that sense, definitely energy flows through the earth, right? It comes in in the, as, in the form of sun, it leaves in the form of heat eventually. But all matter, for the most part, is just recycled on Earth. For the most part, we don't have stuff leaving, and we don't have stuff coming out. For the most part, obviously, there's um, exceptions, like satellites that we launch and stuff leaving, and meteors coming in and stuff coming in. But anyway, any questions about what energy or matter does in an ecosystem? All right, here's a picture of what we're saying. Again, now we're talking about this terrarium again. Um, so again, you should, for terrarium, you could think of like this closed-in aquarium, except for, for uh, terrestrial stuff instead of aquatic. And again, imagine this thing sealed off, right? So it's sealed off, it's, nothing's coming in, you're not getting any water coming in, there's no new gases coming in. The only thing coming in is energy in the form of light. And of course, there's photosynthesis that turns that into chemical energy, and that gets broken down when you do a, a respiration. And of course, some of that energy is lost as heat so on and so forth, the, the, the cycle continues. So again, ultimately energy comes into an ecosystem and then it leaves, right? It doesn't stay in an ecosystem. It might be in there temporarily. Again, all the chemical bonds that are holding these plants together and all the chemical bonds in that snail and all the chemical bonds in that soil, that's energy, right? But eventually that energy will leave this, um, this heat. And again, all the physical matter, all the chemicals, that's what's recycled. That's the big picture of what happens with an ecosystem. So any questions about that side? Okay, so the energy flow and chemical cycling involve the transfer of substances through trophic levels. So remember, that's a lot, one of the last things we talked about on Monday was the trophic levels, where you've got your producers and your primary consumers and your secondary consumers. Remember that pyramid, that triangle? That's what we're talking about, the trophic levels. And again, like I've already said, and here it is again in writing, energy flows through and ultimately out of ecosystems. And chemicals are generally recycled within, oh no, recycled within and between ecosystems. So that's where I was saying when I mentioned the uh, Canal River as an example that yes, sometimes within a specific ecosystem, yes, matter sometimes also does come in and out. But in that case, that would be one matter went from one ecosystem to the other. Nonetheless, it's still cycling. Unlike the energy, which is ultimately coming in and leaving. Any questions about this slide? All right. I know it's quick right off the bat, but let's do the second attendance word. I'll circle it instead of saying it. So there it is. That's the second independent word. I mean, the second word for attendance. Um, an independent work topic if you want to look this up. Again, generally speaking, and I mentioned this way back, I think in chapter six, possibly chapter five, and maybe even chapter seven. But mostly, as we know, ultimately, and this is what this was a test question you guys had before. Ultimately, the energy comes from the sun. Also, that test question might be on the exam again, because remember, the final exam is taken from your first three exams. So ultimately, that's where the energy comes from. On a side note, because people got this one wrong too, directly. Your cells get energy from their ATP, right? Ultimately, it comes from the sun. Directly, it comes from ATP. Anyway, back to the independent work topic. Ultimately, the sun generally comes from, or the energy generally comes from the sun, but there are exceptions if you want to look that up from, for independent work. What are, what are some ecosystems where their energy does not ultimately come from the sun? And I'm using the word ultimately because think about this. There are some ecosystems on the bottom of the ocean 
that don't see the sun, but their energy still comes from the sun. So you have all the things living above it that die and then just rains down dead material and things eat it. So ultimately that energy did come from the sun, but there are some exceptions. There are some places where it doesn't. So that's a good independent work topic. Anyway, any questions about this slide? I got to rush through this. Slow me down if you need to. Let's talk about energy flow and ecosystems. As you already know from many, many chapters, even starting from chapter one, this is one of the properties of life. All organisms require energy. And if we take a closer look at the energy flow through an ecosystem, then that'll answer some questions for us. We can figure out why there are so few top level carnivores. Matter of fact, one of you wrote about that on independent work. And we're about to talk about it again, or we're about to talk about it. We can also figure out how we can apply the energy flow concepts to use our resources efficiently. So this is kind of like a bio, we're kind of dipping into bio on a weight here, environmental biology. If we understand how energy flow works, then we can be more resourceful as humans on how we use our uh, resources. As far as the exam is concerned, this slide is nothing but an introduction into what I'm about to teach you. There's nothing on here that's going to be on the exam, except maybe that first bullet point. But that's only because we've been talking about it for chapter one, chapter five, six, and seven. We're all about energy. So hopefully you know by now that all organisms require energy. So here we go. Primary production. This should be a very simple concept. It's kind of in the name. Let me put an X to these numbers just to indicate I'm going to teach you about them. But... There's nothing, well, I'm not going to put an X to that one. That is maybe one of the numbers you need to know. Anyway, um, Earth gets about 10 to the 19th kilocalories of solar energy per day. And if you want to look that up, because that's probably for most of you just a number. If you want to look that up and try to compare it to something like how much energy is released from, a, I don't know, a small nuclear bomb. How much energy is released from a certain volcano. How much energy is released when a rocket launches, something like that. You can compare this number to maybe something you'd be more familiar with. And you could even write that for independent work. Try to give me some, like, compare it, right? 10 to the 19th kilocalorie is less than this and more than this, if you want, right? Come up with some comparison so you understand how much energy that is. Anyway, most of this energy absor is absorbed, scattered, or reflected by the atmosphere or the surface. And of all that energy that we're getting hit with, that, that 10 to the 19th kilocalories, um, only about 1% of that is converted to chemical energy. So that's the number you need to know. And I started to X do it, but I'm not going to stop myself. So you do need to know that of all the sunlight that hits us, only about 1% of that is actually put to use. The rest of it is gone. Also, again, even though I'm not going to ask you about this 10 to the 19th, so you know what that number looks like. That means, because I know not all of you are really good at math or even like math, 10 to the 19th means that's a 10 with 19 zeros behind it. So that's a lot of kilocalories. Anyway, any questions about this slide? So again, for the exam, the big, the big picture here is that the Earth gets a lot of solar energy every day, and only about 1% of that is actually converted into chemical energy, right? Only 1% is used in photosynthesis. Brings us to some terms you need to know, like biomass. That is the amount of living organic material in an ecosystem. So, for example, like if you had, and I'm just guessing here, if you had like, if you took, I don't know, 100 square feet of a desert and you measured all the living things in that 100 square feet, and then you compared it to 100 square feet in the Amazon, right? You could imagine there's probably a lot more biomass in the Amazon. There's just things growing er everywhere in the rainforest. And of course, in the desert, it's kind of sparse, right? There's a lot of sand. There's a few little scrubby uh, brushes. Occasionally, you'll, you'll see an animal. But that's what, my, that's what biomass is, right? It's just the amount of living stuff. The next term you need to know is primary production. And hopefully, this is really easy for you. It's in the name. That is the rate at which producers convert solar energy to chemical energy that is stored in the biomass. In other words, primary production is just, if you want to put it this way, is how much things are photosynthesizing. If you want to put it that way. Sort of like the photo, photosynthesis respiration um, experiments that we did. In a sense, that was primary production. We recorded, we measured primary production 
by the change of pH, right? If the pH went up, that means it was photosynthesizing. So if it went up quickly, that means primary production was happening quickly. If it went up slowly, primary production was happening slowly because it was converting, it was going through photosynthesis, right? It was taking that chemical energy, or excuse me, that solar energy and storing it as chemical energy. Now, primary production on Earth as a whole yields about 165 billion tons of biomass per year. I'm gonna put it next to that just meaning that I'm not going to ask you that number. Point is, that's a lot. 165 billion tons of biomass per year. And of course, again, that might be a big number for you to heart. It might be hard for you to picture. So if you want for independent work, convert that to anything. 165 billion tons equals how many bananas, how many elephants, how many Ferraris, whatever it is that you know, how many baseballs, I don't know. Figure out how many of whatever you know, and then you write it for independent work. 150 billion tons equals blank. Blank amount of blank, whatever you want. Anyway, that was what I was kind of talking about right here with the biomass. I said, you know, if you compare it to square, 100 square feet of desert to 100 square feet of uh, rainforest, for example, right? I use that. That brings us to this third bullet point. Different ecosystems vary considerably in their primary production and their contribution to total production of biosphere. That's not going to be a question. This is kind of an introduction to what I'm about to teach you, right? So I'm not going to ask you, do different systems, do different ecosystems vary considerably? Yes, they do. I'm not going to ask that. But again, I was kind of getting at that. And you could hopefully just imagine that, right? Again, comparing a desert to a rainforest, you can imagine the rainforest has a lot more living stuff. All right, any questions about this slide? The most important things for the exam are you understand what biomass, what biomass means and primary production. Not only for the exam, but also because I'm going to be using those terms um, as we move forward. I'm going to put it next to this too, this, or at least next right here. Just meaning this is nothing for you to study and memorize. But yes, you can see here like where the most productive. Again, a tropical rainforest, very productive. Um, desert, very unproductive. Same with the tundra. I'm just not getting as much light as a rainforest. Also, it's really cold. Um, and as far as the open ocean, that's not very productive. But algae beds and coral reefs, very productive. Again, nothing for you to memorize here. If anything, I might give you that picture on an exam and tell you, like, ask you some really basic second grade question, like, which is more productive, the savanna or cultivated land? Like, okay, okay, there's savanna. There's cultivated land. The answer is savanna, right? You might get some second grade question like that, but probably not. Anyway, are there any questions about this slide? Okay. Ecological pyramids. I've already kind of briefly introduced you to this, but let's officially introduce you to an ecological pyramid. Energy flows as organic matter through trophic levels. That's the first thing you need to know. We already know that energy flows through ecosystems. That's the first thing I've told you today, one of the first things. Now I'm telling you how it flows through. It flows through as organic matter. Right, because once it hits the plants, once that solar energy hits the plants, at that point it's solar energy. But remember, then the plants convert it to the chemical energy of glucose and other molecules, and then things eat those plants. So then that energy is then transferred to those things, and then things eat those. So then that energy is transferred there. Right, all in organic material. It's all caught up in those chemical bonds that make up the plants, and then make up the herbivores, and make up the predators. But here's a very important concept, um, a little bit for the exam, but truly just to understand how this, con how this works. Most of that energy, not even much, most of that energy is lost at each link in the food chain, which is why there's a pyramid. So if there's like a 100 calories of plants, then there's probably only going to be 10 calories of herbivores. And there's only going to be one calorie in the predator because it just loses so much energy. And we'll talk about why here in a second. So what we're going to talk about on the next slide is this bullet point right here. We are going to consider the transfer of organic matter from the plants to the herbivores. So we're going to, again, on the next slide, we're not going to talk about going from here to here. We're not even going to talk about going all the way up. We're just going to talk about this one step just to illustrate the fact that so much energy is lost as you move from one trophic level to the next. Which, again, or not again, but I'll tell you this now. I'm going to tell you again later. This is basically why it's eating meat. For those of you who have started your um, this week's lab, you know this now. 
If you eat meat, you have a bigger carbon footprint. This is the biggest reason why. When you eat meat, you're not eating plants, you're eating something higher on the level, which means a lot of that energy that was in the plants was lost, you know, when the cow ate it or when the, when the pig ate it, whichever the case may be. Anyway, here we go. For most ecosystems, herbivores eat only part of the plant material. This is just part of the story. I'm not going to ask you this, but I'm kind of explain again, I'm explaining where all this energy goes. Like, why is all this energy lost? That's what I'm about to explain, even though I'm not going to ask you how exactly the energy is lost. I just want you to understand it's lost. First of all, right, you've got all these plants doing this photosynthesis. They're converting that 1% of sunlight that we talked about earlier to organic material. And of all that organic material, it's noted that only the herbivores only eat part of that, right? Usually herbivores don't eat the whole plant, right? So they usually only eat part of it. So right there, you've got some energy lost, if you will, some wasted energy, because there's still some energy caught up in part of the plant that wasn't eaten. Beyond that, the herbivores that eat part of the plant, they can't digest everything they consume, right? It's not like everything they eat is turned into part of their body, right? Some of it just pooped out or peed out because they can't digest everything. So again, we have wasted energy right there because again, it's caught up in the organic matter. So your book gives this example of this caterpillar. You see a picture of it at the bottom there. The caterpillar feeding on leaves passes about one half of the energy of species. Again, this is just an example. I'm just illustrating the fact that energy is lost as it goes from step to step. So I'm not going to ask you these details. But as a caterpillar, again, as the caterpillar feeds on leaves, about half that energy is just gone, right? It eats a bunch and it poops half of it out. And then 35% of all that energy is used for cellular respiration. So it's gone. As far as, far as this uh, conversation of energy going up the trophic, up the food chain, as far as we're concerned in that discussion, that energy is gone. 35% gone because it was used in cellular respiration to make ATP, right? And then it breathes out the carbon dioxide, so on and so forth. It's gone as far as this conversation is concerned. Only about 15% of all that energy that it ate is actually transferred to the biomass of the caterpillar. And again, I'm putting excess to this to remind you, I'm not going to ask you all these details, just illustrating how energy is lost. So again, of all that energy, all that energy it got from eating, right, from eating part of the plant, not even the whole plant, but whatever part it ate, whatever energy it got from that plant, only 15% of that is actually stored in its body. And that is the only energy that's going to make it to the next trophic level, right? Because that's what the, this is a primary consumer, right? So that's what the secondary consumer is. Whatever eats the caterpillar, that's what it's getting, right? It's getting that 15% of the energy that it got from eating that plant. That's how much is going to make it to the next level. And again, I'm not. Uh, I'm just going to move to the next slide because, again, there's no questions on here that are going to be on the exam. This is just illustrating the fact that energy is lost as you go from level to level. So here we go. There's a caterpillar eating a plant, a part of the plant, right? So again, a lot of the energy is still stored in the rest of the plant, so that's lost energy. Let's say this thing eats 100 kilocalories worth of plant. 50% uh, of that, right, 50 calories is gone when it poops it out. 35 calories or kilocalories are just lost as it does respiration, right, it's burning that energy. And then only about 15 kilocalories is actually put into the body. So again, out of the 100 calories, kilocalories that that thing ate, once it gets eaten by a bird, for, for example, you know, only 15 of those calories, kilocalories are going to be moved up to the next trophic level. And again, I'll put a big old X through this just to remind you, this is an example. I'm not going to be asking you questions about caterpillars or feces or anything like that. This is just an example. But since we're mentioning it, let's make that the next attendance word, even though I'm not going to ask you about it. There it is. I circled the next attendance word and also a little arrow to it. All right. Any questions about this? This brings us to the energy pyramid, which we've already kind of talked about. I showed you a picture of it earlier. An energy pyramid illustrates the energy loss with each transfer in the food chain, right? It just shows how much energy is lost every time we move up a trophic level. Each tier represents all organisms in a particular trophic level. And this will make more sense when I show it to you again. And the width of that tier indicates how much chemical energy is actually incorporated into the organic matter at that trophic level. 
And I'm probably not going to ask you any questions about an energy pyramid. It's pretty simple. Um, yeah. Actually, let me back up before I go forward. So, again, that's an energy pyramid, right? So this tier represents all the energy that's within a plants in a particular ecosystem. And then this represents all of the energy that's available in the bodies of the herbivores. And this represents all the energy that's represented or that's available in the bodies of the predators, right? So you see it gets smaller and smaller because there's less energy. Because as we know, as we just talked about, energy is lost as it goes from one level to the next. So again, back up a step. Like I already told you, and this is one of those numbers you need to know, of all the energy, of all that 10 to the 19th kilocalories of energy per day that we get from the sun, only about 1% of that is available for primary production. The rest of it, you know, like we said, it was reflected by the atmosphere or absorbed by the atmosphere or uh, reflected by something else. And of that, only about 10% of energy is available at one trophic level. Or excuse me, only about 10% of energy available at one trophic level is incorporated into the next. So those are two numbers you definitely need to know. So 1%, like that we've already talked about, only about 1% is actually converted. And as we go from one step to the next, only about 10% makes it. So again, when we're talking about going from plants to herbivores, of all the energy that's in that, those plants, only about 10% makes it to the herbivores all the energy that's in those herbivores, only about 10% makes it to that next level of predators. I like that your book does point out this. The actual efficiencies, are they vary. Depends on the ecosystem and the organisms you're talking about. The actual ecosystems are about, you know, 5 to 20%. I'm going to put it next to that because you don't need to know that number. For the sake of this 100 level class, instead of saying 5 to 20% because it varies so much, we're just going to give it a nice number and say about 10%. And that is another independent work topic if you want to look into it, like which organisms are most efficient or which ecosystems are most efficient or which organisms are least efficient or which ecosystems are least efficient. So obviously, if we're losing about 10 percent of the energy as we go from one trop tropic level to the next, another way of saying that is about 90 percent of it is just lost. I'm going to put an X to that because I've already given you enough numbers, so I'm not going to ask you to memorize that either. But that should make sense, right? Simple math right there. If about 10% of it makes it to the next level, then that means about 90% of it is lost. And the next slide is going to be a visualization of everything that's on the slide. But are there any questions about what's on the slide? For the exam, what's the most important on this slide is that 1% and that 10%. So there we go. Again, there's the energy pyramid. If there's 10,000 kilocalories uh, worth of plants in any given ecosystem, and that means there's only going to be about 1,000 kilocalories um, caught up in the herbivores. And there's only going to be about 100 kilocalories caught up in the things that eat the herbivores. And only about 10 kilocalories for the things that eat those. So one of those questions I posed earlier is like, why are there such, why are there relatively so few top level Top level predators, and this is why. Because every time you move up a step in the trophic levels, you're just losing a lot of energy. So this one snake requires all this, all this uh, plant material, even though it doesn't eat the plant material. It eats the things that eats the things that eats the plants. Um, so yeah, it requires a lot of energy. And because of that, there's very few top level predators. I'll put a big X to this too, because this is again just an example. I'm not gonna ask you. You know, how many, how many kilocalories are caught up in flowers, yellow flowers? No, that's just an example. But again, you can see 90% of it's lost. Only 10% of it makes it to this level. And then only 10% of that makes it to this level. Only 10% of that makes it up there. So if you imagine like a hawk, for example, that eats this thing, there would only be one kilocalorie that made it up there, right? So again, that's why you have such fewer relatively few top level predators. All right, well, and this is okay. Everything I just said here, it is in writing. The energy available to top level consumers is small compared to the energy available to low, lower level consumers. Again, because if you're an herbivore, you've got all those plants, all that energy in the plants. But every time you, again, every time you move up, you're losing 90% of the energy. So by the time you're at the top and eating the things also at the top, there's not much energy there for you. 
So this is why the top level consumers require so much geographic territory, right? They need a lot of space, not because they need space to like hang out and relax. They just like open space. It's not that they just need a lot of plants to feed all those things that, that they, that they are eating. Anyway, and your book also points out the most food chains are limited to three to five levels. It's just another number I'm not going to ask you, but also a good independent work topic. You want to look up certain ecosystems and say, like, how many, how many uh, trophic levels is a deciduous forest ecosystem, or how many trophic levels is a desert ecosystem? That might be that might require a little work to find your answer, but it would be easy to write about. <clears throat> Any questions about this side? All right, let's talk about ecosystem energetics and human resource use. So basically, I'll give you a spoiler here. Everything we just said, I'm going to say it again, except now I'm going to say it in the context of humans, because we too are in a part of ecosystems, right? Of course, we're kind of different because we kind of control ecosystems, but still, the dynamics of energy flow apply to humans as much as any other organisms. Um, so I'm going to show you a slide, and this, uh, this slide is just an introduction. There's no note. Nothing to write down if you're taking notes. It's just an introduction to what I'm about to show you, which is this right here. There's two different um, food pyramids. Let's just say this is 100 acres worth of corn, right? 100 acres worth of corn, 100 acres worth of corn. I'm just throwing that number out there. This 100 acres worth of corn could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 vegetarians. Uh, meanwhile, if it's somebody who's living off the meat, right, they had cows eating that 100 acres of corn. Therefore, um, although that corn can only support one person. Just an example, long story short, and I put an X through this just again, just to remind you it's an example. I'm not going to ask you any questions, but long story short, uh, people, the, the, the more plants you eat and the less meat you eat, the better it is for the environment. I also want to say this, and I say this a lot to my 108 class, and now I'm saying it to you, now, now's the time. We have this discussion a little bit in this class and not a, little, a lot in that class. When I teach you something's good for the environment or bad for the environment, I'm not saying, all right, if it's good for the environment, you, you should do it. Or if it's bad for the environment, you shouldn't do it. I'm not saying that. I'm just letting you know. Now you know, so you can make an educated decision. You may you decide what you want to do. I'm not telling you you should be a vegetarian. I'm just telling you, for the environment, it is better if you're a vegetarian. Do with that what you will, with that information. It's also better, and your book doesn't mention this, but it's also better, for example, if you eat bugs. Eating bugs is more efficient than eating, uh, eating cows. But again, I'm not advocating eating bugs. I'm not going to do it. But now you know. It's an, now you have that education. You know that it's better for the environment to eat insects. Anyway, let's talk about chemical cycling and ecosystems. We already said that energy flows through um, ecosystems, right? That's what we just got done talking about. Energy comes in in the form of sunlight, and it ultimately it leaves in the form of heat. That was that part. And then I also said chemicals or matter is recycled through um, ecosystems. So that's the part we're talking about now, is how things are recycled. There we go. Again, obviously this is, uh, this is important. I mean, not for the exam. I'm not going to ask you this question, but this is why we're talking about this, because life depends on the recycling of chemicals. When an organism is alive, its chemical stock changes continuously, right? So you are not, chemically speaking, you are changing all the time, right? Every time you eat, you're bringing in new chemicals. Every time you breathe out or go to the bathroom, you're losing chemicals, right? So you are constantly changing, right? Your chemicals are constantly being replenished, going away. Those are constantly changing. And also the atom in an organism, when they die, returns to the environment by decomposers, and that replenishes the inorganic nutrients that producers use to build new organic matter. So this is all stuff you already know, and this is not going to be a test question. None of this will be a test question. It's an introduction to the conversation we're about to have. So as you know, you are, con again, reiterate this, you are constantly changing as far as what you're composed of, because you're constantly bringing in new chemicals, you're constantly putting out new chemicals, and then ultimately when you die, well, humans a little bit less than other things, but ultimately when you die, you're going to get decomposed, and you'll be bit put back into the ecosystem. And of course, humans are a little bit different because you know, we use embalming fluid and we're buried in caskets or sometimes we're uh, um, burnt, right? So we get cremation, right? So you, lo you lose a lot of energy when you get cremated. Anyway, 
again, this is an introduction. Let's move forward. Uh, here's just a picture. So here's a living tree, or at least the roots of the living tree. So its chemical stock is constantly changing as it's putting things out and bringing things in. And then, of course, here's a dead tree that that living tree is now living on. So that thing's dead. It's being decomposed. So all the chemicals in that are going to be put back into the ecosystem. Stuff you already know, I'm sure. So let me tell you this. What we're going to talk about, what the questions are going to be about on the exam, or you're going to need to know some basics about the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. But before we talk about those specifically, we're just going to talk about how stuff cycles in general. So again, this next bullet point is mostly just an introduction to the stuff that you need to know. Chemical cycles involve biotic and abiotic components, and they are called biogeochemical cycles. I'm not going to ask you what a biogeochemical cycle is. I'm just telling you that's what we're about to talk about. It's called a biogeochemical cycle. And you already know this in a sense. It's just now I'm just saying it to you again, and I'm putting it, I'm using big fancy words. So you already know, for example, when we talked about photosynthesis and respiration, right? When, some, when you breathe, you're alive, right? So you are a biotic component. And then you breathe out the carbon dioxide, and then it's in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not alive, so that's the abiotic. So you know things, even just with you, when you do respiration, you are cycling between the biotic and abiotic. And that's basically what we're going to talk about. So all three of these cycles that we talk about, they cycle between living and non-living things. And that's what you're going to need to know. So nothing to write down yet. But when we talk about those three different cycles, you're going to need to know what their biotic reservoir is and their abiotic reservoir. Mostly. That's how you're going to compare and contrast them. So for the carbon cycle, it's mostly the abiotic reservoir. So for the carbon cycle, like where, where is most of the carbon? When it's not in living things, where is the carbon mostly? And when we talk about nitrogen, it'll be, it'll be the same. When it's not in living things, where is it? And also sometimes I'll ask the question, how does it get from the living to non-living? But there we go. We're about to talk about all this. So again, I'm not going to ask you what a biotic reservoir is or what an abiotic reservoir is. It's not the definition. But you need to know what they are because I'm about to talk about them. So again, we are the biotic reservoir of carbon, for example, right? All that, we're, we're made up of carbon. You learn that from chapter three and chapter two. And then when we breathe out and it's in the atmosphere, that's abiotic. Anyway, let's talk about it. This I'm really going to look at quickly. This is almost more confusing. It'll be less confusing when we get specific and talk about those three different cycles. But this is basically how it works. There's an abiotic reservoir, right? And it depends if we're talking about carbon or nitrogen or phosphorus, whatever. It has a different reservoir depending on what it is. Then it makes its way into the biotic reservoir, usually by from a producer. Right, and then things eating the producers, and then when they die, and it cycles through. So I'm going to skip right past through this one because, again, in my opinion, this slide is a little bit more confusing than when we get specific. So let's get specific. And again, there's nothing to write down yet because we are going to talk about separately the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. For the exam, again, you're going to need to kind of know the difference between the three of them. What are the abiotic reservoirs for those three things? And how do they get from the abiotic to the biotic? And you'll see what I mean. This will make a lot more sense when we talk about the first one that you're already familiar with, which is carbon. The carbon cycle. Carbon has an atmospheric reservoir. So there you go. If you're taking notes, you can write that. Carbon cycle, abiotic reservoir equals atmosphere. Because that's not where the abiotic reservoir is for uh, phosphorus, for example, as you're going to learn later. So yes, the carbon abiotic reservoir is the atmosphere. Mostly. There's other examples, and we'll talk about them. Oh, yeah, they're right there on the next bullet point. So that's the one you need to know. And yes, technically, I'm going to put it next to this. Technically, there are other stuff. Um, so fossil fuels, right? Carbon, the carbon in gasoline and in oil. That's an abiotic reservoir, right? That's non-living. There's a lot of carbon there. Um, there's all carbon compounds in the oceans, all that stuff. But again, as far as the exam is concerned, what you need to know is the main abiotic reservoir for carbon is the atmosphere, right? All that carbon dioxide in the air. I'm going to look at the methane. Yes, carbon, the main abiotic reservoir is the atmosphere. 
And then the next question is, well, how does it cycle? How does it go from the abiotic reservoir to the biotic res reservoir? And how does it go from the biotic to the abiotic? And that's this right here. This is what you already know from chapter six and seven. Photosynthesis is how the carbon goes from the abiotic reservoir of the atmosphere to the biotic reservoir of trees and plants, right? Because plants and any photosynthetic synthetic organisms, they take the carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into glucose and other chemicals. And at that point, it is in the living material, right? So then it is in the biotic reservoir. So that's how it goes from abiotic to biotic photosynthesis. How does it go from the biotic to the abiotic? Respiration, right? So when you breathe, right, you, had, you ate all that carbon, you ate the glucose and other things, you broke it down, and then you, as you know, and you know this from chapter six, then you exhale, that carbon leaves and goes back into the atmosphere, right? So again, really quickly before we move to the next slide, the carbon abiotic reservoir is mostly the atmosphere. The way it goes from abiotic to biotic is photosynthesis. The way it goes from biotic to abiotic is cellular respiration. Does that make sense? This one, again, should be a review for you because you already know about photosynthesis and respiration. So let's talk about the next one. The, whoop. That's the wrong part there. Whoops. There we go. Anyway, sorry. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video that uh, talks about the carbon cycle. All right. And here's a picture of it. You don't need to study this picture. I mean, unless you want to. Because what I told you, this is a complicated version of what I told you, which is that most the most of the abiotic reservoir for carbon is the atmosphere. How does it come out of the atmosphere and go to the abiotic reservoir? The photosynthesis. How does it leave uh, the abiotic reservoir and go back, or the biotic reservoir and go back into the abiotic uh, through cellular respiration? So that picture is a little bit more complicated than you need to worry about. And of course, yes, I'll point out too. There are other ways, right? So when we burn fossil fuel. Or we burn wood, right? Then we're taking it from the abiotic or the biotic and putting it back into the atmosphere. So, yes, there's other ways, but those are the main ways. It's a 100 level class, so you just need to know the main ways. All right, phosphorus cycle is the next one we're going to learn about. The phosphorus cycle has no atmospheric component. Or, more importantly, what you need to know for the exam what is the abiotic reservoir for phosphorus? The main answer is um, rocks. So, it's not like there's living things that can just take phosphorus out of the air, right? Because it's not in the air. Where do we get the phosphorus from? What are the abiotic reservoirs for phosphorus? Rocks. That's the main answer. And of course, there are other stuff that you don't need to know about, but you could look it up for independent work. What are the other abiotic reservoirs for rock? I mean, for phosphorus. You can look it up if you want. But rock's the big one. That's the one you need to know for the exam. Rock is the abiotic reservoir for, for, for uh, phosphorus. So just like we talked about carbon, how do we get from the atmosphere into living things, right? How do we get from the abiotic to the biotic? That's what this next slide is going to show you. But actually, yeah. Um, phosphorus moves from land to water faster than it's replaced. I'm not going to ask you that, but there you go. Um, Soil characteristics may also decrease the amount of phosphate available to plants. I'm also not going to ask you that. But as a result, this is sort of important. I might maybe, maybe ask you this. Um, phosphate is a limiting factor in many terrestrial ecosystems. I don't remember if I talked about what a limiting factor is before. I think I did. But I used an example of uh, a cookie factory. Does anybody know like, the basic ingredients to like a sugar cookie? What is it like? Obviously sugar. Flour, eggs, maybe. Well, let's just say it's that. I don't know. It might be other stuff. I don't bake. I cook. I don't bake. Let's say it's sugar, flour, and uh, eggs, right? So let's say you're a factory and you make sugar. You make sugar cookies. That's your business. And you've got like warehouses full of sugar and warehouses full of uh, uh, flour, but you only get a dozen cookies or a dozen eggs a day, right? So yes, you've got a lot of flour, flour, you've got a lot of uh, sugar, but you only get a dozen eggs a day. That's your limiting factor, right? You've got all the stuff. You can make a ton of sugar cookies, but you only get a dozen, a dozen eggs a day. So in the ecosystem, 
phosphate is a limiting factor. So of all the things that plants need to do their to do their business, phosphate is usually one of the things that they don't have enough of. Wow. So and I might ask you that. That's what a limiting factor is, right? There's just not enough of it. And phosphate happens to be one. And because of that, and I'm not going to ask you this, but because phosphate is a limiting factor, this is why we use phosphate fertilizers, right? So when you look at a, when you buy fertilizer, you can see a lot of it. It's like a mixture of phosphate nitrogen. And this is why. Anyway, back to the exam. What is the major abiotic reservoir for phosphate? Rocks. Where does it come from? How does it go from um, uh, abiotic to biotic? That's kind of a tricky question. Uh, one thing you could say is it's because of weathering, right? So the, the rocks are dissolved by rain, right, over time. And then finally, that gets into the roots of plants, and that's where it gets into, uh, gets into the herbivores. But let me go ahead and tell you this. Because that part is so, not so complicated, but because that's slightly complicated, the most important thing you need to know for the exam is the major abiotic reservoir of phosphate, which is rock. I probably not even ask you how it gets to from um, the biotic, abiotic to the biotic. Unlike carbon, for carbon you need to know photosynthesis and respiration. For rock, or excuse me, for phosphate, mostly I just want you to focus on the fact that it's um, the abiotic reservoir is rock. And again, for independent work, you can look up um, some other places. Like where else? What are the other abiotic reservoirs? The next word for attendance. Well, let's just stick with that since it's circled. Rock is the next word for attendance. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the next one. The nitrogen cycle. This is the, the third, the last of the three that we're going to talk about. And, of course, you can look up other cycles if you want for independent work other than carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Nitrogen has two abiotic reservoirs, and you need to know them both for the exam. So, again, carbon, atmosphere, phosphorus. Rocks, nitrogen, the atmosphere, and the soil. Mostly, we'll focus on the atmosphere. That's the, the most important one. So, in a sense, the nitrogen cycle is a lot like the uh, a lot like the carbon cycle. In that, the major abiotic reservoir is the atmosphere. It's in the air. It's in the, it's in the gas. As a matter of fact, and I might ask you this number, but probably not. 80% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. About 80% is nitrogen gas. So, when you breathe in. You're mostly breathing in nitrogen. Even if I don't know, give you that, that number, about 80%, at the very least, you need to know that most of the air is nitrogen gas. Right? Most of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas. But here's the thing. Unlike carbon in the air, right? plants can take carbon out of the air when they photosynthesize. They cannot do that with nitrogen. Right? Nitrogen gas is useless to plants. So because of that... We have another term that you need to know for the exam, which is nitrogen fixation. So how does nitrogen get from the abiotic reservoir to the biotic? The answer is nitrogen fixation. The same way carbon goes from the abiotic to the biotic through photosynthesis, nitrogen does it through nitrogen fixation. And you don't even need to know all the details that you convert it from N2 to ammonia. What you need to know is it takes it from the abiotic to the biotic. And yes, technically I'm telling you how that works. It's because it takes it from N2 gas and turns it into ammonia. And then that ammonia goes through some changes that becomes ammonium and then the plants can use it. But you don't need to know all those details. You need to know that plants can't use the nitrogen in the air. Therefore, they have to have nitrogen fixation, which converts gas, converts it from a gas form to a form that plants can use. Most nitrogen comes from biological fixation performed by two types of nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if I ask you anything, you just need to know that. What does nitrogen fixation? So we know plants do photosynthesis. What does nitrogen fixation? Mostly bacteria. And yes, your book breaks it down. And some, some of them are symbiotic. Some of them are free living. I don't care about that. If anything, you need to know bacteria is what does the nitrogen fixation. There's a picture of what we said. When we come back on Friday, we will finish the discussion about nitrogen cycles. All right, that's it. I'll see you guys in lab or on Friday. And remember, sorry, uh, class is going to be in lab on Friday. Someone else is going to be in this room on Friday. So you would just be in H205 at 8 a.m. instead of here on Friday.